now. Let's try that again. Praise the Lord, everyone. Isn't God good today? So um, we're going to be teaching out of John, the 17th chapter. Begin there with verse 20. How many of you have been doing the people of the book? Amen. We're doing our Bible reading. Amen. So if you, you haven't been doing that, I encourage you to join us. Uh, we're going through selected scripture readings every month, and I know I've enjoyed it um, so far. We started, not I know traditionally people like to start in the book of Genesis, but uh, most folks have read the book of Genesis dozens of times, <laughs> and then they get stuck over there in the law, and uh, then maybe Chronicles or somewhere, and they get bogged down. So this year, we decided to do something a little bit different. Uh, we've been started out with, instead of in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we started out in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, amen. So that's where we got started, we, we did, uh, we've done the book of John, Psalms uh, 1 through 13 and Proverbs 1 through 10. So if you've been doing that and you haven't quite finished, you have a few more days to finish up before we move to February. I would venture to guess that most of us have finished our reading long ago. But the idea behind it is not to see how many, how big a section of the book of the Bible that we can read through quickly. The idea is to read through it carefully and multiple times and maybe consume it. If you like to read it, maybe uh, you read it and then listen to it or then you listen to it and then read it or maybe you read it in multiple versions. The idea is to really uh, dive into these readings and to understand what the Bible is saying to us rather than just quickly reading something to check check off a list of books. Hey, I, I read that. Well, how much did you comprehend? How much did you retain? So anyway, that's sort of the idea this year behind this program that we're doing, people of the book. So I'm enjoying it. We're going to continue to this year uh, remind folks month by month so that we're all reading the same things and we're all on the same page. Amen. So a lot of what you will see this year, probably, my guess will be, you'll see a lot of Bible teaching in, in uh, maybe on Wednesday nights and even on Sunday mornings in the adult class will probably come out of those readings. So this morning is out of the book of John, which of course I hope all of you have read by this point. Uh, John, the 17th chapter, beginning with verse 20, we're going to talk about today the prayer, Jesus prayed for me. How many of you know that Jesus prayed for you? Amen. Jesus prayed for you. And it's recorded. Thank goodness for the Apostle John. He recorded this. So it, it just does something good for me when I, when I first realized that Jesus actually prayed a prayer for me. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for me. I mean, that's, there's something powerful about that. I mean, it's, it's powerful when, you're, when your mama prays for you. It's powerful when your pastor prays for you. It's powerful when an elder in the church that's lived for the Lord for 50 years says, says a prayer of faith over you. But to know that Jesus himself prayed for me is something that uh, is really, really, really powerful. Let's, let's see what Jesus said. John, the 17th chapter, verse 20, neither pray I for these alone. Um, so he was talking about uh, in the previous parts of the chapter, verses 1 through 5, Jesus prayed for himself. In verses 6 through 19, Jesus prayed specifically for the apostles. And so when we get into verse 20, Jesus pivots to praying for all believers. He says, neither pray I for these alone referencing the disciples that he had just prayed for, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, 
that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them as thou loved me. It's a beautiful thing to know that Jesus said, uh, Jesus is praying here that God can love us the way he loved Jesus, the only begotten son. Think about that. It's a powerful, powerful prayer that Jesus prayed. So let's break down a little bit of what Jesus prayed for us. Verse 20, we'll read it again. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Which shall believe on me through their word. When I read this scripture, we had a little note written in the margin of my Bible here that says, Apostolic authority. Believe on me. It's a powerful, powerful concept that Jesus empowered and instructed his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples. And after receiving the Spirit of the Holy Ghost at the day of Pentecost, the apostles did just that. Jesus prayed for them uh, and he prayed for those who would believe on him through the word of these apostles. So Jesus taught his disciples. He, you know, that he had, his ministry was approximately three years, three and a half years. Um, but he wasn't, his, his ministry wasn't activated for a really long time. However, while he was here ministering on this earth, he was training those that he handpicked. You remember that Jesus was walking by the seashore and this, some of the disciples were in their boat mending their nets. Jesus says, follow me. Of course they do. You know, Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And we know that one disciple was under the fig tree. And uh, his buddy says, come, hey, we found Messiah. Hey, I'm coming. All right, let's see about this. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? <laughs> Jesus said, I believe it was Nathaniel. Behold, Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile. <laughs> you know, and Jesus said, well, before, I believe it was Philip. Well, Philip called you, told you about me. I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Oh, I blew his mind. Blew his mind. And Jesus says, greater things than these shall you see. So, so Jesus handpicked these guys. I mean, he calls them, you know, from a, a multitude of different trades. Mostly, uh, most of them were fishermen, guys that worked with their hands. You know, we had Matthew, the tax collector. So we have these people. We've got John, who was really young. So there was a variety of backgrounds, uh, but they they were Jewish guys, and they had things in common. Uh, but Jesus uh, imparted things to them, taught them. He hand, he he handpicked these guys and spent time with them, praying with them, training them, sending them out two by two, teaching them how to pray and how to care for others. And uh, he sent them out to to do the work of the kingdom. He taught them how to baptize. It's, it's interesting that in Scripture, Jesus didn't baptize, but he taught his disciples how to baptize. And how do we know that? Well, if you want to see what apostolic authority looks like, it's demonstrated for us in the Scripture. In the book of Acts, we just went through the book of Acts. Uh, I know some of you were happy to get out of the book of Acts. Y'all were tired of being taught out of the book of Acts, I'm sure. But it, all of the things that Jesus taught the disciples to do once they are filled with the Spirit in Acts, the second chapter, the church is born, and you begin to see apostolic authority in motion. Amen. What do you see? You see people filled with the Holy Ghost. You see people baptized in Jesus' name. You see demons cast out. You see deaf ears open and eyes open and miracles are done. Uh, Peter and John at the gate, beautiful. They walk in, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And, and, and the lame man gets up. How does that happen? They have apostolic authority. Amen. I'm so thankful today that Jesus imparted wisdom and power and he taught his disciples because once Jesus left this earth, the work of the kingdom and founding the kingdom of God uh, took off 
Amen. And Jesus told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So upon the teachings of Peter and on the other apostles, amen, the church was founded. But it's a, it's a comforting thing to know today that these apostles weren't just making up things as they went. They were empowered by, the, by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit, amen, to do the things that they did. Now, many people were fortunate to hear the original uh, 12, well, minus Judas, uh, preach the gospel. They were, they were privileged to hear them teach. I mean, and, and unfortunately, I, you know, selfishly, I wish that we knew more about the other apostles. I mean, we know a good bit about Peter. We know a good bit about John. We know a good bit about Matthew because he wrote the gospel of Matthew. So, so we know about those guys. You know, sometimes I wonder, well, Whatever happened to old Thomas, or you know, what what did Philip the apostle do? You know, hey, I, I wish we knew more about that. Of course, there is some some history, if you will, on the those. I, I've I've read some of the history on them and how you know they were martyred and, and different things. And I take some of that with a grain of salt because we really don't know. It's not scripture. Uh, it is interesting reading, and I encourage you to read that. Uh, you read how some of them were boiled in tar, or hot oil. Some of them were crucified. Peter supposedly was crucified upside down. Uh, one of the apostles was supposedly martyred in India, struck through with spears. There, there's all sorts of things, uh, you know, that that are recorded in history that may or may not have happened. Um, but nevertheless, even though we don't know what all of the apostles did in their ministry, at least we don't know authoritatively. We do know what some of the apostles did, even though we've never heard them. Even though your grandparents and your great-grandparents never heard the apostle Peter preach or never heard the apostle Paul preach, we do know what they had to say. And we do know about the apostolic authority that Jesus gave them. And how do we know that? Somebody help me out this morning. How do we know that? The scripture, the New Testament. Absolutely. We, we didn't have the luxury of hearing them firsthand. However, we have access to their authority through the written word of God. The New Testament uh, was written by men under the direction of the Holy Spirit and is the ultimate authority in a believer's life. It is authoritative for your life. The word of God. The only thing that Jesus wrote, what's the only thing that Jesus wrote? Do y'all know? What you think it caps off to? Go ahead, Brother Nate. In the sand. The only thing that we know that Jesus wrote was in the sand. We don't even read anything else. We know he wrote in the sand. It's interesting. Jesus chose not to write the New Testament, he chose not to baptize could have done those things, but he chose not to. But he empowered his disciples to do those things. Jesus made sure to teach his disciples who then taught believers and wrote many of the New Testament books. Peter, John, and Matthew are examples of the disciples that wrote New Testament books. Paul, of course, we know the Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Um, and his companions, Luke and John Mark, also wrote under the unction of, of uh, the Holy Ghost and wrote with apostolic authority. James and Jude, the brothers of Jesus, also wrote with apostolic authority under the direction of the Holy Ghost. The things that these men wrote are authoritative and they're applicable to our lives today. So we have access to apostolic authority through studying the word of God and through the anointing preaching of that word of God. You know, it's interesting, and I've heard it said many times, but God will never um, contradict what the Bible says. If someone tries to give you a prophecy, a word of God, a word of encouragement, they try to teach you something, that is in contradiction to what you know is in the word of God, don't believe them. That goes for me. If I try to tell you something that is not in the word of God, you better question it. 
but how are you going to question it unless you study it? We all have to study the Word of God. That's what was so admirable about the Bereans. Remember the Bereans? They searched the Scripture to see if these things were so. Amen. We have to be like the Bereans. We need to search the Scriptures and see if these things were so. So Jesus prayed this prayer. Neither pray I for these alone, being his disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. After the, after the um, resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples in John the 20th chapter. We'll read a little bit there from verse 26. So John has appeared to the disciples, and of course we know that good old brother Doubting Thomas was not there. Thomas wasn't there, and so in verse 26, um, after Jesus had appeared, it says eight days again, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and this time, old brother Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then, th then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Be not faithless, but believing. So Thomas had said he wouldn't, unless he could touch the nail prints in his hands, unless he could see that wound in his side, I'm not going to believe this guy. This is too much. And Jesus had told him, he had told him he was going to rise again. But that, that, that Thomas says, guys, this is just too much. This defies logic. Come on, really? You guys are buying this? I, I'm not going to believe it. But Thomas is there with his buddies. And Jesus comes in and says, touch my nail prints, put your hand in my side. Be not faithless, but believe. It's easy for us to be faithless. It's so, but Because so much of the supernatural defies a logical brain. And we're taught and we're trained to scrutinize and to be skeptical, uh, you know, to take things with a grain of salt and uh, seeing is believing. Y'all heard that saying before? All these things is common for our flesh uh, to scrutinize things. And Thomas was no different. But Jesus said, be not faithless but believing. And Tom, Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. So Thomas saw, he touched he, as the Apostle John wrote in uh, the first, uh, the first John, he says, "We've held him, we, we've touched him, we've handled him with our hands." So, so Thomas was the same way. And Jesus said, "Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they which have not seen." And have Ladies and gentlemen, that's that's us. We've not seen, and yet. I wonder how many of us today um, would have believed without the Word of God. None of us, <laughs> right? How would we know? We wouldn't know. You don't know what you don't know. But we believe on Jesus Christ, not because we've touched him with our hands, not because we've sat down and had a conversation with him face to face, but we believe on him through their word. Amen. And, and I think that takes the great, if I'm just, I'm not pinning roses on us now, but that takes the greater faith. It's one thing for the apostles to have lived that amazing life that they lived. Can you imagine having breaking bread with Jesus, praying with Jesus, walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus? seeing Jesus perform mighty miracles, hearing the wonderful teachings of his word, getting the explanation of the parables from his very mouth. Can you imagine that? You have not experienced that. You've not heard that. You've not seen that. You've not touched him. And yet, because of the apostolic authority found in this Bible, we have access to Jesus Christ. We believe in him. Amen beautiful thing. Verse 21, and they, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that 
the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, we're going to be one, but if we're going to be one, we have to be one in the Lord. We, we're never going to be united. Jesus prayed for us to be united. One. There's no division in one. You can't divide one by anything, really. <laughs> right? It's a whole. One. It's whole. It's solid. It's complete. If we're going to be one, and we're going to be whole, we're going to be unified. We have to be unified in the Lord. There are too many opinions. There are too many personalities. There are too many different doctrines that are being preached. The only way to be unified is to be unified in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's let's look at uh, let's look at John ten and sixteen. I'm I'm skipping some of this this morning. I could have went on apostolic authority another thirty minutes. So let's look at John ten and sixteen. We'll actually back up and read verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not a shepherd, whose sheep, whose own sheep, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. The wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hiring fleeth because he's a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd know my, and know my sheep and am known of mine as the Father knows me. Even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Let's read that again. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now you tell me, what is Jesus talking about? Well, there may be. That's exactly what I was going to say. Jesus is talking about the Gentiles. So Jesus was sent to the children of Israel. He was sent to the house of Israel. And that's where the majority of his work was done. Of course, we know that he did some work in Samaria, the woman at the well. We know that the, the lady uh, asked him for healing, and he says, she said, but even what even dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. We, we know about that. Most of his work was done with the Jewish people. But nevertheless, he wasn't just coming to shed his blood, nor was he going to be the shepherd just for the Jews but for the Gentiles as well. So he was teaching them uh, that he, I must bring and they shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. And we see that brought to fruition, of course, in the book of Acts. And we see how that Peter, when he was at Cornelius' house, uh, or when he was supposed to go to Cornelius' house, he had a vision. And he got the interpretation of that vision of all the unclean things and he didn't want to get up and slay and eat those unclean things but the Lord said what I've called uh, what I've sanctified don't call it unclean and so Peter goes to Cornelius' house he begins to preach while he's preaching the Holy Ghost falls the Gentiles are filled with the spirit of God the Samaritans in the book of Acts Philip the evangelist preaching to them what happens the apostles come and lay their hands on them so the Samaritans, which are, we can refer to them as half-breeds, if you will, half-Jewish, they have Jewish ancestry, they also have Gentile ancestry. God brings them to the kingdom. The Gentile believers that have no Jewish blood, no Jewish heritage, no Jewish teaching and background, they don't know what the Torah is, they haven't been taught the Torah, they don't know anything, but God fills them with the Spirit and brings them into the kingdom. But Jesus said there's going to be one fold, many Diverse nations, many diverse cultures, many diverse ethnicities from all sorts of backgrounds. And 
yet Jesus says there's one fold and there is one shepherd. Romans, the 12th chapter. Let's, let's turn there if you have your Bibles. Turn with Romans, me to Romans 12. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members are not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Amen. So we know that we're the body of Christ. We all together make up, have a part in the kingdom of God. Uh, it says in another place that you can't, the hand, you know, the hand and the foot, you know, they, they got to get along. They got to work together. The hand can't save the foot. I don't need you, <laughs> right? The arm can't save the leg. I don't need you. You got all the bodies of Christ. We're, we're all in the body. There is only one fold. There is only one body. Galatians, the third chapter in verse 28. Actually, we'll read verse 26. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, that being the law. For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're all the children of God by faith. you got to have faith to be a child of God. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on faith. Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're all one in Jesus Christ. So Jesus prayed for us to have unity. But did you know it's up to you and I man, to practice that unity, to foster unity? Uh, and in doing that, we have to put aside our own agendas and our selfish motives and, and things of that nature. And we have to submit to the will of God and we have to be submitted one to another. I mean, we have to love one another. The only way that unity works in a church is through a spirit of forgiveness and of love and of pulling for a mutual goal. I mean, if you want to come in and, and pull for your own agenda, you can do that to the destruction of the body. You don't believe me? Just start. Uh, if this church was to do a major remodel, there would be a lot of opinions on what color the walls should be. If we were going to redo the pews, everybody might have an opinion on what fabric they'd like to see the pews. I would have an opinion of that. But you know what I would have to do? Realize that I'm probably not the best one to be picking out the fabric for the pews. Because you can only have <laughs> one pattern in one color. Is that right? And we're not going to paint one wall blue because Brother Ryan likes blue and one wall lime green because Brother Billy likes lime green and maybe Brother Nate likes gray and we paint that wall gray. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? There's going to be one color. There's going to be one color, one choice for the fabric, one choice for the carpet. Somebody's not going to get their way. Amen. But whoever doesn't get their way, you can't just go around and, well, I'm not going there. They don't, they don't value my opinion. They who? It's us. It's we. It's not a they, them. It's, it's a we and a us. Amen. It's a teamwork approach. It's a, it's a team set mentality when it comes to the kingdom of God. It's unity. And and whenever unity works in the church, we have to understand that we have to forgive one another. I mean, if, the, if your brother offends you, Peter, Peter wants to put a number on it, doesn't he? Jesus is teaching on forgiveness, and old brother Peter wants a number. Well, how many times? How many? Seventy times? <laughs> well, what Jesus says, seventy times. And forgiveness, living together in unity. Let's read Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and I'll, we'll close with this. Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, 
and in you all. Amen. So what did Jesus pray for all believers? He prayed for us that believe on him through their word. Amen. Apostolic authority. He also prayed that we would be one in him. Amen. We we have to be one in him. If, if there's ever a fracturing in a church, division in a church, hard feelings in a church, you can be you can guarantee that we've gotten outside of the will of God. One, two, we need to go to the Lord in prayer and get some things right. And where does that start? It starts in me. Amen. If someone offends you, I encourage you always, the first thing to do is check your own spirit. Check your heart. Pray about it. I mean, Jesus said, blessed are they that are not offended. We're gonna, if we're ever going to, to do what God has called us to do, we have to be one together in unity in Jesus Christ. Amen. We need one another. I need you, and you need me. It's interesting that Jesus prayed for us to be united in him. He could have prayed a lot of things, but he prayed for us to be united because he, he knows us. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We love your word. Thank you today for these wonderful folks. Mighty God, they're so attentive to the word. I thank you today. Lord, I pray that this, this word would help us to be reminded of the things that you prayed for us, that we believe on you through apostolic authority, that we be united together in you in unity. Lord Jesus, we pray that we be unified one with another. Lord, that your kingdom's work, the kingdom uh, of heaven, Lord, that that will may be done. Lord Jesus, in earth as it is in heaven, Lord Jesus, we pray today that we would see revival, we'd see mighty revival, Lord, in our church and in our community, and we know that that begins with each one of us loving our brother and loving our sister, Lord, as you loved us, Lord, that we might see what you would have for us come to fruition. In Jesus' name.